All right, so the thing that I wanted to get up here and talk about is just about lenses and giving people an intro because I personally feel like lenses are a critical part of my day to day hassling. Um, and knowing where to start with this stuff is really daunting. If you look at the types and everything that is in lens, it's crazy. Well, it's not crazy, it's just a lot to digest in one hit. Um, but I was kind of thinking about it and uh, I kind of realized that about 90% of my lenses, lensing kind of comes from 10 functions and types. So I really wanted to talk about that and just introduce them in the simplest possible way so you guys can pick this up too and run with it without having to sort of get sort of bogged down in the details. Because I went that route and it was slow and it's kind of annoying and I I hope that people can learn faster than me if I help them all. That's the aim anyway. Let's see if I succeed. Because um, learning these details and history is really important, um, but you don't really need to do it at the start. I think you can go very far with lens, and I think I did too, not knowing this stuff. And let's see if this is possible in this talk. Alright, so we're going to talk about optics. I guess optics is the general umbrella term for all of the things that we're talking about. Lenses, prisms, folds, traversals, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and really what it is, it's, it's a universal API for dealing with immutable data, both extracting data from it and modifying it. Um, obviously without mutating it, because it's immutable. Um, really, we go about this by composing getters and setters through the way of lenses and prisms, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the composition is a really important part. It would be really boring if we had to write a prism for everything that we wanted to grab out of the structure, being able to glue these together is the most important part. And being able to do that safely is also really important too. Um, and I claim, I guess I've been doing Haskell for a bit now, and I think Tony will agree with me that if you have nested immutable data, you will need lenses. I can't do without them. Uh, they just make your life easier. Uh, and not having them is too much of a pain to worry about ignoring the massive dependency list or something weird or fancy like that. Um, these days I pretty much always create lenses for my types. I, I went through a period of like, you aren't gonna need it, I'll put the lenses in when I end up needing them. And I just ended up always getting sad that I hadn't created them. So I guess I, I'm starting this from a place of I went through all of this, I thought I wasn't going to need lenses, and now I end up creating lenses for everything. So if you can skip ahead to that, and trust me, at least for a little bit until you figure it out, uh, then that might help you along and have the journey be quicker than mine. Alright, let's talk about lens. Now, I, the way to describe a lens is a, a getter set of pair for focusing on a single part of a product. So if it's got a field, uh, we can go in there, we can grab the value out, and we can set it and return you a new thing. Um, the definition kind of looks like this. It's a bit of a lie. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than this, but the general idea is this. Is there anybody here that doesn't know Haskell syntax and will be confused if I don't explain what's going on here? What does mean? That is a typo. I was tired. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'll talk through the hands of Pascal syntax here, and just put your hand up if I'm talking quickly past any other syntax that's getting in the road. Uh, we, we've got time to talk about it. Uh, so this is a function. Uh, it's a bit weird because it's on multiple lines, so I could comment it. Uh, but it's saying that this is a function called lens, and it takes two arguments. Uh, one is the getter, which is a function that takes the thing that we are lensing upon, uh, and then gives me the A inside it. So this is, a, this is a polymorphic thing, it's saying, given this S, I can return you an A. Uh, the setter is the opposite side of that, so it's saying, give me the old S, give me a new A, and then I will return you an S with the new A inside of it. So this is like setting a field and returning the new record. 
Uh, and this here is just saying the result of this function is a thing called the lens prime. Don't worry too much about that. And that has two type parameters. So we're dealing with a, an S, which is our target record or product, or whatever you want to call it. And then we have a, a target. So we're going into a text field or something like that. And we'll see more of this in a bit. All right, so to kind of explain this, uh, we'll, we'll define things by hand. You don't need to do this, but it's a good thing to see so that you understand what's going on underneath the hood. Um, oh, that's terrible. I'm too short to point to. Um, so we're, we're defining a person record here. Uh, it has a record accessor called underscore p name, which just says I've got a field in here called p name and it is text. And there's also an age to this record. So it's a record with two fields. Uh, we're going to create a lens ju that just focuses on the name. Uh, and we do that by giving the, uh, this, this record accessor stuff here creates functions that go from person to text and person to int uh, for this function name and this function name. So we can use that as a getter here to say this is the thing that takes a person and returns text. And here is our setter function here. So we're, we're taking the old person, we're taking a new name, and then setting that old person to have the new name that we want. Uh, and we can define a test person here called Ben, uh, and we can use this little weird operator here uh, called view. So we can say, I'm going to take my target record thingy here, view with this lens, which is P name, which is putting in this text, and if I run that, I'll get back the string that I'm expecting. Uh, I can also use this lens to set. So I can say, using the pname lens, I want to set that target with the string Ben clearer, uh, and then apply it to my test person that I have here. Uh, and this returns the record with the updated name, not changing the age at all, as you kind of expect. Is that kind of cool from a syntax point of view that it's all good? Uh, Alright, we can do exactly the same thing with template Haskell and it's kind of the recommended way to go. Uh, some people probably still disagree with that. There are some generic stuff, but this is the easiest way to get started. Uh, and we're just saying here, I got a social media type. It's got some stuff inside it, maybe some lenses for it. And this template Haskell will go for every record in here, make a lens for it. It does that and it will strip the underscore off. So if we look at what we have here, we, we get exactly the same lenses as before. We get a P name lens, we get a, a social person, social media lens that drills into this type, and then we have a lens on social media that will get the Twitter handle for a person. Uh, it's all a bit contrived, but it's just some simple stuff to kind of demo this stuff. And I can use these lenders, and the, really the power here comes from how I can compose these things together. So I can, I can say, Ben, I want to view the social media part of my person, and then grab the uh, Twitter handle out of that record. Uh, and that gets me back Ben Calera. Uh, and I, I can also use this to set, also composing these things together. So the setters and the getters compose. And I can say, for, the, for these two lenses combined, take the target of that and set it to a much cooler username, uh, and we get back the person with just that Twitter handle updated. Uh, so that's kind of what we're after here. Um, we can also chain these updates together um, using the ampersand operator. Don't worry too much about this at the moment. It looks kind of weird, but it's nice to see, because you can just copy this and it'll work. Uh, and you don't have to worry too much about it. We'll see it on the next slide, but this kind of does two updates. It's updating the name and the Twitter handle. And we pass our bin thing in that we created before, and it updates both fields. Um, cool. So that looks really weird, and it's a bit mystical. So, the, but the really cool thing about the world of lens is, it's not always true, but sometimes you peek under the sort of hood, of something that looks really complicated and weird, and it's just a function. Uh, this, it's definitely not always like this, but this is cool. 
So when we apply our set little combinator here to p name with a string, we get back a function from person to person. Uh, and if we got to put some parentheses around it to kind of make it a section so that it will type check for GHCI. But if we do what we did before and kind of chain these sets together with the ampersand, we, get, we still get back a function from person to person. So that's kind of how this stuff works under the hood. It's just there's a function, there's a function, wire it all the way through. Cool. There's another thing that you probably want as the sort of basic tool for lensing, and it's a thing called over, which is this little percent tilde thing. Um, saying the words out loud kind of makes the combinators a little bit less scary, so if you have the words, it's a lot easier to find them. So read this as over, which is... No, it's not going to work. Um, so that instead of setting the value to a specific thing, this thing here is now a function that takes the old string that we had and then concatenates a URL onto the front of it, prevents it. Um, not saying that concatenating strings is the best way to deal with URIs, but it's an example of taking the previous value and making a new value out of it. Cool. So I told a little bit of a lie before, and I was talking about lens prime kind of being a thing, and we were hiding some details, and talking about monomorph. I don't know. I can't even say my type. Of monomorphism. Wow. Cool. I invented a new word that makes no sense. Um, so our lens prime thing is a thing that has a a target sort of record, and the thing that it is targeting inside of that. But the, the thing that Lens does really well, and uh, if you just had Lens Prime you wouldn't be able to do this, is that it allows a little bit of extra stuff to be able to update things like this container here, which has a type sort of parameter, that when we are changing a field, we could change the type of the record by changing it, say for instance, from a box of an int to a box of string. Uh, and that's what these extra things are for. So the, the S is the original target record. The T is the resulting target record. Yeah? Um, Oh, in the type alias at the top. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's totally should be an error there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No. If there's anything weird like that, it's probably a typo. Um, I'll point out. Uh, the question was whether that there should be a function error there, and the answer is yes. That's just a typo. That's my bad. Um, so the, the, the T gives you the, the target type after you've set the thing, and B gives you a new target after you've done the set as well. So if we look at the, if we look at the type of the lens for unbox here, we have a lens of box A to box B. So we start at box A, we can move to box B, and the target types are A and B. So we can do things here like, actually transform this to an int, to a string, and we can do all that kind of stuff. Without this extra STAB, we wouldn't be able to do that. So, probably don't worry about that too much right now, but just loosely have that in your head that this is for sort of polymorphic updates, and you won't get angry at it when you see really dense type signatures, because there's more parameters if you peek under this. I think it gets to six, but it's okay. All right, so the thing with uh, view is that it doesn't actually need a whole lens. Uh, all it actually needs is a thing called a getter. Uh, kind of ignore the, the extra type parameter here. For our cases, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you could actually re replace this with a type alias getter, SA, for, for the purposes that we're dealing with right here. 
um, but this is the full time. Um, so all, all our view thing is, is it takes an S and a getter from S to A and then returns you what, what thing you were targeting in that thing. So we can, we can kind of lift any function we want to a getter with the combinator too. So we can say, I got a function that takes a text, uh, takes a text here and we'll prepend this to it. I can lift this into a getter by using two, and then I can compose my social media to my Twitter, and then get a Twitter link, and then actually get this text back. So I don't need to sort of mutate the object in place, I can kind of just transform it on the way out. That's something that I use a fair bit when I'm pulling data out of stuff, and just need to do a little tweaking at the end to sort of transform it and make it how I need it to deal with it in my code. All right. Um, so we need to look at the other side of the fence here, which are, which are really prisms. So where lenses kind of model products and different fields, slots that can be in a product, prisms really model, uh, in a way they model the constructors and the, the possibilities of each constructor for a given data type. So each prism for a, for a sum type allows you to focus on that branch of the sum type, and we'll see we'll see that an example of that in a bit. And it kind of allows you to either get or update um, that particular thing that you're focusing on, depending on whether we're at that branch. Or not. And hopefully that will make sense. We can also do model some things like uh, crazy partial transformations, like crazy ones like text to JSON. Uh, but there are some, some additional rigor that you don't see in normal JSON parsers that is needed to make that a valid instance. You've got to maintain white space and comments and all that kind of stuff so that the text that you get back when you go the other way is exactly how it was input. But it is a thing, while we're always doing this uh, JSON parser thing that uses lenses all around. So it is possible. But let's move on to defining prisms. So if we make another contrived thing of we've got a user ID for our system, and it can either be an internal ID, which is an int, or it can be a Twitty user. And when it's a Twitty user, it's just kind of their, their app handle. Um, so we can make a, we make a prism that focuses on the internal ID branch, uh, which says to construct this side of the thing, we use this constructor, uh, which is uh, for the people who haven't seen Haskell, this is a data type which is user ID and you can construct it either with this constructor using internal ID 42, whatever, or you can construct it as a twin user uh, with a text thing inside it. And the reason why some types are cool is that we, when we pull them apart and deal with the value of user ID, we either need to, we need to deal with the case of it is an internal ID and I have an int, or it is another thing and in this case, it, it is a Twitter user, if it's the other thing. Um, so in this side, we are trying to focus on the internal ID, which is the int, because we've got a prism that is focusing from user ID to int on this branch. Uh, so we just pull that out and return just i if we've got one, otherwise we return nothing. And Twitter user is just the same on the other side. Um, but of course, we don't want to write that out by hand every time. We probably would almost give up on lens if that was the case, because it's very repetitive. So we can just go and make prisms with the user ID type, and it'll create both prisms as we saw before. So there'll be an underscore internal ID and an underscore Twitter user. That one focuses on the int, and the other one focuses on the text, if it's a Twitter user thing. Cool. All right, so we can... We were talking about how a prisms can focus on one bit if the value is of that constructor. Uh, so let's look at that in action. Uh, we've got our thing before, we've got a person, and now it has a user ID and our type we've got before. Uh, we can compose our lenses that we saw before with the prisms that we're making and kind of combine them into a thing that can focus on the person ID of the person and the internal ID, if it is an internal ID, and return either just the thing that we're focusing on, or it will return nothing, if, that's, if our user doesn't actually have an internal ID. Um, the one change that we're doing here is we're using 
this guy here, uh, which is called Preview. Um, Preview just focuses on that one thing if you found it, otherwise it returns nothing. If you're after specifics, it's because a prism is a traversal, which is either pointing at zero or one things. A traversal can point at zero or many things. And no matter whether it's a traversal or a prism, it will uh, preview or return zero or one things, no matter how many things are on there. We'll just get the first. But we can also set via a prism, and that's pretty cool as well. Uh, so we can take our composition of person ID and internal ID and set it to 42. And if if the thing if the test subject that we're working on is actually an internal ID, it will make that update. Uh, otherwise, if it if we try and set a Twitter user on a person that doesn't actually have a Twitter user ID, uh, it will just be a no op. So there'll be no update at all. All right. So at this point. Are there any questions? Did I go too fast? Did I lose anybody? Or is that kind of enough? Uh, nobody's completely lost and has any questions? Because now's the time to stop if there are questions. Looks all good. Alright, some quick extras. I'll run through them pretty quickly. But they are, they are pretty important. Uh, there's another concept called an ISO. Uh, which is a, it's, it's a total mapping between two types. So if we, if we talk about the ISO of string to text, we're saying that all strings can be transformed to text and all text can be transformed to string, which is definitely, it is more power of, it is a stronger abstraction than prism because you have to be able to go both ways. Um, and the interesting thing about that is we can treat it as a lens and a prism. It can do both, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, and we can, the way that they can be used is, uh, like, uh, if anybody's familiar with the data.txt pack and unpack, pack takes a string and returns a text, and unpack takes a text and returns a string. Data.txt is just an alternative representation for strings in Haskell that is faster than the default. Uh, so we can, we can define the pack method just as I'm going to take x, which is my string, uh, and view with the packed ISO, so packed is this guy here. Uh, but to do the opposite way, we can flip packed on its the other way around and make it a ISO of text to string, uh, and then use view on it to go the other way around. So that reversibility is really interesting, um, and we'll see in a little bit why that's cool. Uh, and we can do the usual extraction, so we can compose these and do all the nice things. So if we are storing text in our Twitter user, but we, we actually need strings in our code, we can kind of just whack from packed on the end and we'll get string out, um, which is particularly cool. Uh, you can even put, if you had a really crazy string function that only worked on strings, you could put a dot to crazy string function and it would map on the string and then convert it back to text in your record if you really wanted to do something like that, but probably not at least. Where you end up wanting these kind of transformations is with this guy. Um, so if you're doing a lot with types, you've probably got some new types around the place because if you spend all this time modeling your records and just have a lot of maybe text, when you pull that all apart, you're kind of lost. And you've lost all the information of where that stuff came from. Um, so there is a thing in Lens called wrapped. Don't look at the types. They're crazy. And don't be afraid of the four extra syntax extensions that you have to turn on either. Don't worry about it, it's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, so we go make wrapped of a person name, and what that wrapped instance thingy allows us to do is call this guy here, which is a crazily polymorphic thing that looks for an instance of is wrapped and makes that happen. Um, but what that allows us to do is we can define our record fields as something like person name, which is a new type. And if we need the text out of it, we can just go person name from wrapped and then extract the text. Uh, there's the opposite way, of course. If you just go, if you had dot wrapped, it would be going from text to person name because it's, it's an ISO. 
I'm going to put the crucible. Oh, no. I was going to put another example in there. Anyhow, um, the thing that I was going to put in there that I didn't commit, obviously, uh, is you could put a, you could put uh, setters or whatever on the end of this composition to change it as text, but wrap it all back up in the new type as though it wasn't really a new type at all, which is particularly cool. But be careful with this, right? Because all of this magic can kind of let you easily forget that you've wrapped it up in this type that's conveying information. So you can kind of wrap everything up in new types and then forget about this extra rigor that you put in there and actually add no rigor, just mess. Uh, so be careful with it. Uh, there is, you can go too far off the end of just treating it as though it's pretty much text with wrapped. Uh, but it is a nice thing to have in the toolbox. Uh, the, uh, the thing that um, might not be obvious just looking at wrapped is because these, this wrapped thing is an ISO, for it to be lawful, you have to, you have to be able to say that all text can actually be person names. If you had some text that couldn't actually be person names and you had a smart constructor or something like that, to kind of filter down the domain of the text that you could fit in a person name, wrapped is not the thing that you want. You want a prism. Uh-oh. you definitely want a prism because you want to be able to say that not all, you want to be able to establish in your optics that not all texts can actually be present names. So be careful of that. The, the distinction is subtle there and it kind of feels like you can just make magic happen, but by exporting this make wrap thing, you're ruining your ability to export a smart constructor and say, I can control the text that goes in this thing. All right. Last cool thing, a thing called at. At is pretty cool. Uh, it, it gives you index lenses into the index structures, things like vectors, things like maps, uh, and it does some really cool things with optics on top of it. Let me get out of that feedback. Um, we can say, if we've got the list, with, if we've, we've got the map with just one element in it, with an uh, index of one and world, we can go at one and grab just world out of it. Uh, so if it wasn't there, it would return nothing. Uh, we can say on an empty map or a populated map, uh, I want to take this, this sort of lens, which is focusing on index one of the map, and set it to just world. Uh, and then that will return this list here. If you set it to nothing, it would delete the entry. Um, we've, and we can do we can do over stuff as well. So we can say, I've got this existing list, and we're saying at key one uh, over this function, I just want to prepend hello to it, and we kind of get back hello world as we expect. Uh, if that if that wasn't there, it wouldn't be an error. It would just do nothing. So you kind of have this nice thing of if it's there, I'm going to change it. Otherwise, don't care about it too much. Cool. Uh, there is another thing called IX. It looks pretty much the same, but it gives you a traversal instead of a lens. So you can't, you can't set a value that's not already in the map. You can only update something that's already there. Because it will just give you a view into something that is there, or it will give you nothing. And if there's nothing, there's nothing to set. It's just like a prison. You can't say, you can't set four onto a maybe int when it's nothing. Uh, you have to kind of go a level above and say, I'm going to set that thing to just four. So just be careful of that. It's, my recommendation is always use at, uh, and if the extra maybes are annoying you and you're just doing read-only stuff, use IX. Um, yeah, at least at the start. Anyhow, I've rattled on enough about what Lens is. Why the hell do we care about this? We talked a little bit about it, but really it's just this idea of making mutable, immutable data just as easy to deal with as mutable data in something like Perl or Python. 
Uh, and I think Lens comes pretty close. Yeah, there's a learning curve, and that kind of sucks. Uh, but once you get there, you get something so much better. So I think the journey is worthwhile. Um, something else that you can do is when you're publishing lenses, you can publish lens as your API so that you're not actually publishing concrete data types anymore. You're saying, I'm publishing a type and I'm not giving you access to the constructors, I'm just giving you prisms and lenses. And with those, you can get access to all the constructors and all the fields of those constructors somewhere or another by composing them together. But now you're not dependent upon the concrete structures of my data types anymore. So I can change them and version them and kind of give you a consistent API and just change the lenses underneath you where they point. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I know Tony is really into that of really making APIs that are easy to grow over time because th there's a layer of abstraction and lenses and prisms give you that algebra of talking about data access in a very total and universal way. Uh, and it also brings a, a sort of wealth of goodness. There's so much in control of lens, and I think that's why it's so intimidating at the start. You look at it, it's like, there's so much code in there. It is 3% shell, though, if you look at GitHub. I don't know what that's about. You should probably fix that. It's probably a ginormous Travis thing. Um, but yeah, there's so much stuff in there. Go have a look at it. It's just cool stuff that Ed has already written because he's already done this stuff eight years ago. It's all there. You just have to know how to find it, and that's the hard part. And I suggest the best way is just to go into IRC rooms and say, I've got this problem, can you help me? Because it's very easy for somebody to give that answer, and they've gone through the same pains as you all. Uh, and it's, yeah, there's just so many lateral jumps to make in this, like all the functional programming, that having that kind of person who's your mentor is really helpful, and it's the fastest way to go. Um, and we'll speak a little bit more about that later. Um, and we didn't talk about the laws at all. Uh, George would be very upset at me, but I was trying to keep this to half an hour. He's not in the country. He's flying over the... He's like in international waters right now. He can't... There's no laws there. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so th there are laws to all of these things, and they help keep all of this abstraction and all the stuff that we're building on this these very simple optics, they help keep them safe, sane and actually compose well. Because the, the whole thing that we're after with functional programming is not really, I mean, the goal is kind of abstraction, but the goal is abstraction that you can compose together with sort of equation of reasoning, that we don't have to worry that we're going to break something weird by composing two things together. We'll not have to load all of the code and those two layers above just to try and reason about those things, two, two things composed. I haven't done JavaScript in a while, and I like that. Um, need to do less of that. Uh, further reading, there is a lot of good stuff. Have a look at the lens package. Uh, there's a hierarchy diagram that talks about folds and traversals, uh, and a thing above ISO called equality, which I don't really know what it is, but I guess it's a stronger, it's not saying that these are, sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah. It is the same thing. Cool. Uh, and it will take some of the sugar coating off my talk and show you the, so the, the concrete types underneath. Um, going through the control lens course, code is not the good way to figure that stuff out. Uh, but just go through all the other stuff. Control, there's a lot of cool stuff in control exception lens for doing classy MTL stuff, uh, abstractly throwing exceptions in the transformer stack, it's pretty cool. Um, Ed's talk, which is like four times as long as this talk, uh, he did it at Boston Haskell a few years ago, uh, there's a YouTube video and there are the slides, go look at that because it kind of explains all of the stuff in depth and why it is the way it is, uh, so it's a good thing to look at, uh, but the best way to figure out all the history uh, and kind of the, the details of where we came through. I, I did this course, what would we do it at Yale? I must, must have been like four years ago or something crazy. Um, but it's really good because you kind of implement the, the simplest lenses that people tried 10 years ago 
and build it up through the progressions of what people tried and what worked and what didn't work uh, to where we got to today. Because uh, if you just look at where we are today, it's like, whoa, that is the gnarliest encoding of this that you could possibly come up with. But there is a lot of sense to how we got here. So going through this will help you understand that. And it's even got the next generation of lenses that don't exist in control of lens yet, which are pro functor based rather than functor based. Do you, know, do you know whether that will ever happen in control lens? You know it will never happen? Oh. Sorry? Oh, yeah. yeah. But we've got control of that category, right? Anyhow. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, fine. <laughs> uh, but uh, the other thing is, come chat to us at QFBL, our job is really, like literally, to make this stuff easier. So if you guys need mentoring, just hit us up on IRC or come join us in the, in the office. If you've got these kind of problems and want to sit with us for a couple of hours, we can smash the repair with you. That's a really good use of our time if we kind of enable you to run with this stuff uh, and just sort of kick butt with it because we want to make more and more of this stuff happen in Brisbane. Uh, thanks, I think that's it. Uh, are there any questions? And you don't really need to care about it for this kind of usage. Uh, if you're trying to abstract over the lists and do traverses and folds over there, it, you'll start needing it. But for the entry level lens, you do not need to know this stuff. So that's why it's left out. There could be a second half hour talk for the next level lens. And we progressively get to Ed's two hour talk. Uh, but I wanted to get it as cram packed with the 90% that I always use. I'm trying to get that out there. Any more questions? Good man. Cool. I think pizza's here, so it's cool. Right. Thanks, man. Pizza. <laughs>